Welcome to Advanced Data Analysis 1 with me, Eric Erhardt, Professor of Statistics at the University of New Mexico. In this video, we'll be reviewing univariate summaries, both numerical and graphical, for continuous random variables. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit on the course website and scroll on down to the timetable. We're looking at effectively the plotting univariate uh, part of this covered in chapter one and as always there's a link to the R code I'm going to open this in a new tab that we'll be covering throughout this lecture so we'll go on to chapter one the PDF right here each chapter um, I would like you to read through it's these chapters are written to be read and they all start with uh, some learning objectives, the things that I want you to feel confident about and have some command over at, by the end of uh, this chapter. So first we define what random variables are. A variable that takes a number and that number is subject to a random process, that is a random variable. So for example, you could assign a variable y to be the height of the next person who walks through a restaurant door. And that height, uh, that random variable, will take a number, but you don't know what it is until you observe it. And so that is the random process. Uh, variables of this sort take, or of any sort of data, take two broad categories, and each of those categories can be broken further down. So the first type of category is a qualitative data. These are categorical outcomes and either those categories are based solely on their name and those are called nominal groups such as hair color blonde brown black platinum blue green any sort of color that you can create these days those are categories but the categories themselves don't have any specific ordering and so because they are unordered they are nominal ordinal on the other hand are ordered categories and one standard example of this is a Likert scale a scale common in psychology where you have say preferences which are ordered you know how much do you like popcorn <laughs> or do you like popcorn as much as the next guy uh, strongly agree agree neutral disagree and strongly disagree is one example of that and these categories are clearly ordered that is, strongly agree is somehow greater than agree, but you don't know that the, the distance between these two categories is necessarily the same as the distance between agree and neutral. For example, to go from neutral to agree, that might just take a small nudge in your opinion, whereas to go from agree to strongly agree may be more substantive. <laughs> substantive. Um, however, that those distances may be different for you than they are for me or some or uh, the next guy that guy who likes popcorn so much all right the other data type is quantitative and this includes numerical outcomes okay uh, and the two types are discrete such as um, the number of children um, you can't have uh, 2.7 children even if you are an average family and uh, continuous is the other type, where you, the outcome can take any numerical value. Um, you know, even in this case, birth weight can only be positive, but it can take any positive value. So when, when you've got these ranges that can be uh, broken down to effectively the, the, the level of precision of your measuring instrument with the hypothetical scenario that your measurement can only can always be more refined at least down to uh, plank length look that up plank length it uh, basically pr shows that everything is actually discrete uh, one more thing these categories up here of nominal and ordinal you may actually code things as being uh, categories right uh, so like type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Those are numbers, 1 and 2, but those are still um, categories. Okay. 
So just because you code something with a number does not mean it is a numeric outcome. All right, let's take a look at a couple clicker questions. And uh, I recognize you are not sitting at home with your clickers. But the point is, read these questions, press pause, think about it, come up with an answer, and a good reason to justify your answer. These two questions have to do with a radioactive mass emitting particles, and the average rate of these particles is 15 per minute. And we want to know what the random variable is. So, define a random variable x to be the number of particles emitted in a 10 minute time frame. What is the type of random variable? So because it, because it is a number of particles that can take only integer or non-negative integers, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, I'm probably expecting if this the average rate is 15 particles per minute, I'm expecting about one particle per four minutes, so I'm probably expecting two or three particles. But there, you know, maybe I get zero, maybe I get 20 particles. But anyway, that is a discrete random variable. Next question. Say a particle is emitted at noon today. Define the random variable x to be the time elapsed between noon and the next emission. What type of random variable is x? Because this is a time, and maybe you have a very sensitive and specific stopwatch, uh, then you can measure this to any resolution that you want. I will treat this as continuous, the length of time. All right, numerical summaries. This should all be review for you, and I'm just going to uh, point out a few things I uh, certainly want you to know from this. Okay, so let n represent um, the size of a sample. In fact, let n be called the sample size, that we have drawn a sample from a larger population in order to learn something about that population. We're going to have notation here. Y1 will be the first observation and, and the value of that first observation. Y2 is the value of the second observation and so on, up to Yn, which is the last observation. These numbers, uh, or these variables, Y1 through Yn, take numbers. For example, a person's height, their weight, their systolic blood pressure, some, some number. Okay. We're going to indicate by the sample mean, or for the sample mean, we're going to designate as y bar, and st standard deviation as s. Okay. So those are going to be measures of central tendency, the mean or spread, that's the standard deviation. And calculating these should be very familiar to you. Uh, the mean of a set of observations. So in this example, we have eight children who, whose weights we've collected, five up to 40 pounds. Then we're simply going to add them up, divide by the sample size. That is the arithmetic average, which equals 20. In R, we can do that by creating a, a list. So C is our combine function, and we're going to combine these numbers into a list and put that into a variable Y. The mean of y is 20. Standard deviation is calculated by taking the square root of the variance. And the variance is the sum of the squared differences of each observation from the mean. So first you need to calculate the mean. That sucks up one degree of freedom. And then you take all the paired differences, square them, add them up, divide by n minus 1. That gives us 156.3. That is s squared. have to take the square root of that to get 12.5, the standard deviation. And these are the functions in R, variance. And standard deviation is simply sd. Now, statistics like this almost always have a unit of measurement. 
For example, Y bar was in pounds. The average was 20 pounds. S squared is a squared unit, so that's in pounds squared, which is typically why we discuss spread of a distribution in terms of the standard deviation S, because it is also in pounds. 12.5 pounds is the spread with a center of 20 pounds. They're in the same units. Here are two uh, graphical representations. On the left is the graphical representation of the mean. So here are the eight weights of our children. And the sample mean is if this was on a teeter-totter or a, uh, you know, a, a, a balancing board, then the fulcrum, or the point where this balance board balances, is the sample mean. It's also called the first moment. The, on the right is a depiction of the variance. Okay, so 20 was the sample mean, and each of these points, you can think of, see the distance from the mean of 20 out to the point, and we're squaring that distance. So we've got the squares. And if you add up all those squares, let me scroll up to the, uh, to the formula for variance for a moment. Okay, so this distance, y i y 1 minus y bar, that's the distance from 20, and squaring it, and then adding up all those squares gives us the numerator of the variance. So you can imagine when you get a point that is far from the mean, you get a really big square. Similarly, if you get a, a point far from the, um, the center of the data, of course, it's, it will end up shifting where the center is. So if you put a boy way out, or a girl, <laughs> way out on, on this board so the weight is, was like 80, then this teeter-totter is going to tip over unless you move this balance point way out towards that extreme observation. So these two measures, mean and standard deviation, are sensitive to extreme observations. Something that is not as influenced by extreme observations is the median. The median is an alternative way of specifying the center, and the interquartile range is another way of specifying the spread of distribution. So here's uh, the median is the effectively the point that separates the data into equal halves, a lower 50% and an upper 50%, and the interquartile range is the distance between uh, the distance between the two points that distinguish the center 50% of the data. So here's a, a data set that has eight data points. It's those same weights. And we're going to calculate the median from these data. So we have already sorted the values here. Um, in the original example, we hadn't had them sorted yet. Down in the lower left, we've got the code for sorting data, sort. Y gives us the ordered values, and the median is going to be the uh, the point that is located right in the center. Um, I thought I had a picture of this. There we go. So here's our eight points along the axis. The median M is the the point that separates the lower fifty percent from the upper fifty percent. And we pretty much all agree that the, the median is the center point between these two points, okay? Um, the technical definition of the median is it can be anywhere in between these two points, but we just all agree that it's going to be the center. Now, for the lower half of the data, we can specify the first quartile. That's going to separate the lower 25% from the, the next 25%. So that's effectively the median of the lower half. The median of the upper half is Q3, the third quartile. And finally, the interquartile range is the distance from Q1 up to Q3. That's the center 50%. So these, these are called quartiles. Q1, the median 
is also sometimes called Q2, and then Q3. Those are the points that separate the data into quarters, which is why it's, why it's called quartiles. If you separated the data into 20% blocks, those are quintiles. So the interquartile range is Q1 to Q3. All right, uh, let me scroll up just for a moment um, and see how to do this in R. So we've got our vector y. The median of y is 16. The five number summary gives us the median in the center, 16. Q1 is 10.5, Q3 is 31.0, and then the minimum value, 5, and the maximum value, 40. Those are the extremes. And those five numbers, known as the five number summary, uh, breaks the data into four quarters. If you ask for summary of a numeric vector, which we've seen before, this gives us the five number summary and the mean. So we have the minimum, first quartile, median, third quartile, and maximum, as well as the mean. And the useful part about the mean is to see how close it is to the median. Now you'll notice that the five number summary gave us a, a Q1 value of 10.5, but the summary gave us 11.25. And I'm, I'm going to suggest not making a big deal about this. Uh, the, court, the quantile function, which is used within summary to specify um, certain quantiles, so uh, particularly the quantiles that we're specifying here is the 25th percentile, or quantile and the 75th percentile. Those can be calculated in many different ways. In fact, um, as of right now, there are nine types of calculations for quantiles. And in fact, I think that none of them actually match the five number summary. So the point is that uh, they're going to be close and don't worry about it. They basically are describing the distribution to a level of accuracy that's that's just fine for us. Um, okay, so I have manually calculated the interquartile range here, the IQR. Right, it's the difference between the, if we go up to five number summary, the third quartile, or Q3, and the first quartile, Q1. So that's going to be 31 minus 10.5. If I pull from the five number summary, these five numbers, and ask for the second element, 10.5, and the fourth element, 31.0. So here's my five number summary. And within the square brackets, I'm going to pull out certain indices, the second and fourth value. That's these, these two. I can take the fourth value minus the second value and get 10.5. Alternatively, uh, the difference of, of those two, basically this little vector here, difference, takes the difference. <laughs> and it knows to take the second one minus the first one. All right, so we just did that with an even number of observations. What happens if we omit, say, the largest observation? So there was a number 40 in our data set, and we're going to drop that value. Now we only have seven values. It's basically the same thing. When we have an odd number of values, there is a specific number that separates the data into two halves. The number 14 separates the data into the lower 50% and upper 50%. So that is our median. Okay, I'll let you uh, read through the rest of that. So let's take a look at um, a slightly larger example. Here we're looking at the head breadth in millimeters for a sample of 18 modern Englishmen. So we've, basically we have their skulls, and we're taking a measurement roughly from the temple, temple to temple on each side of the head and measuring how far that is. Okay, about about 15 centimeters. So we can uh, calculate uh, the sample size 
the length of the vector is 18. Uh, we can do, give us the five number summary, the range, the difference, and all those summaries. One new quantity here is the standard error of the mean. This is effectively our level of uncertainty in the sample mean relative to the population mean. That, that is, if we were to draw another sample of size 18 of English men and measure their, their modern head breadths, we would get a slightly different sample mean because there's variability in our sampling. So we would get a slightly different uh, mean. And the standard error, SE, is a quantification of how variable the mean is between samples. In contrast to the standard deviation, which says something about how variable observations are between each other within a sample. Okay, so standard deviation relates to observations, and standard error represents uh, the variability of a statistic, typically the mean. So we've got a, uh, a few questions here on numerical summaries. Let's go take a look. All right, so numerical summaries, unemployment. I'm going to save you some reading. Press pause here, read through this, and answer the question, and I'll come right back. All right, you've answered the question. So the main points here is that we've got one broadcast reports that the average time until reemployment is 4.5 weeks, and another broadcast says the average is 9.9. .9. Now the word average is vague. Do they mean the mean? Do they mean the median? You know, the median is sort of like a typical value. Or do they mean some other measure of, of average? There are other measures. There's a geometric average um, and other things. So which one is, which of these two values is likely to be the mean and which is likely to be the median. Well, one thing to think about here is what are possible um, values that can be taken. Okay, so this is the distribution of time until you're re-employed. So when you lose your job, the timer starts at zero, and then numbers can be positive from there. So it's possible that someone's out of, could be out of work for a year, which would be you know, 52 weeks. And if you have one or two extreme observations like that, it will affect the mean of the data, but not the median. And so if you have one or two extreme observations, the mean will be inflated, but the median is going to change, uh, it will stay the same. The median does, is not sensitive to what's happening with the extreme observations. The median is really only interested in the center or the, the middle few values. Uh, and I hope no, none of you selected answer D here. All right, let's start plotting. So I'm going to cover four types of plots, and I'm going to effectively skip over one of those. So dot plots are really cool when you've got small sample sizes and you want to show every value in the data set. Let's take a look at what these dot plots look like. So here's our modern Englishman and there's six representations of this dot plot and I'm going to tell you what my favorite is. Um, actually I have a favorite on in both in each column. I like the one in the top right the best it shows the head breadth, let me zoom in here, it shows the head breadth of the Englishman, so it goes from 130 on the low end to 160 on the upper end, and on the vertical axis is a frequency. And we have a point for each observation in the data set. 
and they stack up and you can see what the shape of this distribution is. The center is somewhere, you know, around 146 or so and it looks roughly symmetric though there's one small head down in the bottom it, on the left hand side. Um, the one be below it is the same except it's centered so it has a some symmetry and the one on the bottom stacks is like like it's centered but uh, it starts with the bottom a center row stacks on the top then stacks on the bottom and will alternate in that way. Those are all plots created by ggplot. In the left column we have versions of this in the base graphics and it requires some options. So the, the basic dot plot unfortunately um, stacks all the points on top of each other. You actually need to um, specify to stack the points. Otherwise this, this plot looks like the one in the upper right hand corner for ggplot. And this bottom one uh, is similar, except we are using jitter in order to um, have the points vary up and down. So I will go up and take a look at the code for that very briefly. It's just these. Um, so on the left, we made those three plots. And this is each of these strip chart commands produces one plot. So I want to describe to you how I got all three of them together. There is a function called par, which is for graphical parameters. So PAR is short for parameter, and it's specific to graphic parameters. I'm going to um, provide an option. MF stands for multi-figure, and rho indicates that I'm going to fill those, fill a multi-figure panel up by row. In this case it won't really matter. There's another option called MF call for to fill them by column. Anyway, I'm going to create a little grid with three rows and one column. So if I page down and take a look at what we had, we have three rows, uh, one, two, three, and it's all in one column, that left column. So the first one is a plot of HB, that's just the vector of, of values for the head breadths. Main is for the main title, that is text that will appear at the top, and X label is the label that appears on the bottom horizontal axis. So Modern Englishman is the title, head breadth is the x-axis, and uh, we've got the plots there. And in this I'll page back up, I have some methods here, method equals stack or method equals jitter. Those have to do with how the points are being displayed. And CEX is the size of the characters. So CEX equals 2 made the points a little larger. Uh, finally, I have specified another option on the last one, frame.plot equals false. I'll page down. You can see that these points are larger than the, this first plot. That's the CEX equals 2. And then the frame false means that there's no box around this last plot. So just showing a few options. The ggplot ones take a few more lines but they are pretty intuitive. First I have to load the library ggplot and ggplot is expecting an input here that is a data frame. So I'm taking hb which is a vector and I'm going to put it uh, change the data type into a data frame effectively making it a column inside a data frame. I'm going to call that data frame hb underscore df. So I'm going to input that column as the data set for ggplot and assign the aesthetic of the distance along the x-axis as the value hb, the head breadth. That sets up my axes. Then I'm going to add a layer by putting dot plots. And the bin width equal 2, meaning that if you had a person who has a head breadth of 1, 
let's see, well, let's go find an example. Here's 150, it has three dots. And if we go back up to the numbers here, uh, we have a, let's see, we have a 150. Oh, we actually have three 150s. Okay. Let's see, we have a 148 and a 149 and a 148. Okay. Those are three numbers. The bin width equals two means that it's going to gr group numbers that are within um, bins of two units in width. So we'll get 148s and 149s together and we'll see that there are three observations in this column. Those three dots, each of those either takes a value 148 or 149. And you can see the units. 140 is here, 150 is here, and there's only five dots of width between those two points. Finally, um, labs is a way to specify labels, and you can specify the title, you can specify the x-axis, y-axis, uh, and other labels in there. Another way to specify labels is to use xlab or ylab to label the axis. Um, the other options were um, within dot plot. So bin width equals 2 is one way to make slightly bigger dots and bigger bins. Here's the centering, and here's the center hole for the different types of stacking. Finally, putting uh, I assigned each of these plots to different variables. So I have P1, P2, and P3 as the three different types of plots. Using the grid extra package, I am going to arrange a grid of plots, P1, P2, and P3, into one column. And that is what we see. See a column of three plots, nicely arranged. Okay. I recognize talking about the R code takes some time, but it is also uh, important to me that you feel that you have some command over being able to create these sorts of plots. So I recommend when you're using R, just to uh, show an example of, of what I'd like you to, to be doing here, uh, if I run library ggplot2, and uh, let me go over to the functions that we were just using. So within ggplot, we're using geom.plot. So I can ask for help with the question mark, geom.plot, and press enter. You can get help in there. And you'll see that there's lots of options. Okay, There is um, there's a position. There is uh, the method. Those, those are probably the two uh, main ones that I would be um, thinking about here. And for each of those op options or arguments, you can look down below and see what the other options are. So for, for example, method was one that we had specified. So I'm going to scroll down and find method. And so dot density is for dot density binning or his dot for fixed width. That doesn't seem to be exactly the thing. Oh, stack direction. My apologies. Let's go back here and stack direction. That's the option that I wanted to look at. So which direction to stack the dots? Either up, down, center, or center hole are four different options. So you might consider running that code these four ways and see what's produced. Ultimately, I do want you to do some experimentation with R and uh, ask R to do things and, and have it come back with you with answers. All right. The histogram, um, and I'm going to sort of skip over stem and leaf displays since we don't typically use those very often, but it's basically a type of histogram, uh, is a way of uh, taking the range of the data, breaking that range into intervals, and then counting up how many observations we have in each interval and mapping that to a vertical uh, distance along the y-axis. So for the head breadth data, 
here are plots for that and I'm going to let you um, well now I'll go up and, and describe the the plots a little bit I'm pretty much just going to ex explain the ggplot ones okay so there are a few features on this plot there is uh, first of all I'm mapping HB to the horizontal axis the vertical axis automatically is going to be mapped to count or the frequency of points I have the histogram itself which is the number of points so here's the value 2 so these lower bins each have one observation in them whereas this far right bin has two observations in them and I have also added these uh, a list of points on the bottom this is a little small okay these these little tick marks that's called the rug and the rug is um, the actual values that were observed along the along that axis so you can see for example this box right here is one unit tall because there is one tick mark below it one tick mark in the second box gives us this this height in this next box that has four observations that's because of these four observations one two three four boy this is really hard to point and, and discuss <laughs> must be even harder to to listen to uh, whereas these last two tick marks are what contribute to the height of this box being two so let's scroll up and look at the code the only difference between this histogram and the one on the far right is how wide the bins are notice the, win the bins here are two units no they're probably about five units wide the one on the right is maybe the, a width of two units we are about to find out. So here is the ggplot for this, and same thing. We have the we've created this into a data frame. We've mapped um, the horizontal axis to HB, and we are going to plot the histogram with a bin width of five. Geom rug gives those other tick marks at the bottom. The only difference between this first plot P1 and the second plot P2 is that we've specified a bin width of 2 as the width. The, there, if you do not specify bin width the uh, ggplot will take a guess as typically the range divided by 30 is going to be the bin width and you would probably be unhappy with the default. It's, I think it's best to uh, specify a width that works for you. All right, so I'm going to skip over stem and leaf plot. It's basically a histogram where you specify um, the histogram with the actual numbers in the data set so that you could actually recover the, the original observations from the plot. It's a very cool method. It works very well for small data sets. All right, box plots used all the time. The box plot is the five number summary that we calculated before the minimum first quartile median third quartile maximum those are that is a box plot and okay. so here's a description from the help from mini tab to describe a box plot and this box plot is currently uh, is organized in the or oriented in the vertical direction so you can imagine a y-axis up and down that takes the values the minimum value is this point at the bottom then we have the third sorry the first quartile which is the edge of the box the median is the center line of the box the third quartile is the upper edge of the box and finally the maximum is the last point now this is called a box and whiskers plot the box indicates the center 50 percent of the data from the first quartile to the third quartile and these whiskers there's a uh, typically some choice for how long those whiskers are before they end and and uh, one, one version of that is that the whisker will go out one and a half the width of the interquartile range so whatever the height of this box is this whisker will extend up to that point and then stop 
before showing where before indicating points beyond that as extreme observations so in in Minitab, they're calling these outliers or unusually large or small observations. Okay, and uh, that is what this paragraph says, 1.5 IQR. Okay, so here are box plots of the head breadth data. Um, I've computed the five number summary here, so if you want to match that up with the uh, what you see in the plot, you can. The minimum is 132, and so that's going to be this left edge is 132. Same thing here, this left edge of this whisker is 132. And then we have 142, that's the left edge of this box. Here's 140 on the axis. Then the median is 147, that's the center line and so on. Okay, In, GG, in, a, in R's base graphics, the function box plot creates this box plot. In ggplot, after you've assigned the axes, and for some reason in the current version of ggplot, you have to assign the continuous variable to the y-axis, and then later on flip the coordinate so that it lays horizontal if you want it in that orientation and you can put some dummy label in for the x. So here I've assigned x equals quote hb and that is what quote hb is what's showing up here on this axis. And I've assigned geom box plot as the geometric object to plot. All right. So let's talk about box plots for a second. I'm going to skip over stem and leaf. Here's an example of two box plots, one for two, two separate samples. So true or false, there's a greater proportion of values outside the box on the set on the right than on the set on the left. So recall that the box plot in is the five number summary from the from say the maximum bar up here to the edge of the box here that's 25 percent of the data and then from the edge of the box to the median that's 25 percent 25 percent those are it separates the data into four quarters so regardless of how what how long these whiskers are that's still only 25 percent of the data so there's 25 percent of the data on the right in this upper whisker there's 25% of the data in this upper whisker on the left so these should be the same proportion of values and you should be very confident all right there are some um, other ways of displaying things like a box plot one is a violin plot, and I'm going to uh, just describe it right here. So I've got three separate plots here. The one on the bottom is a box plot of the head breadth data. Up top, I've got a um, histogram in those boxes. And then I also have this, this curve, this line. This is called a, a, density, a density curve. It is a, a way to give effectively like a smooth version of a histogram. And if you take that curve and you make it symmetric about um, an axis, so for example there's a, a curve that's curvy on the top and curvy on the bottom in this middle plot, that is called a violin plot. And this middle plot has two features. It has the, it has the box plot in the center, right? the white dot indicates the median, then we have a, a bold line which is the box and then the whiskers are the thin lines on the edges and then we also have this smooth curve over which gives us a little bit more information about the shape of the distribution and in later examples we're going to see that this is a uh, this is pretty handy okay uh, before that though let's talk about how influential extreme observations can be 
in a box plot. So here is a data set for the income in thousands of dollars for a sample of 12 retired couples. So here are their, their values. And before you even plot this, a couple things probably stick out to you. One is there's a very large number here. This is a couple that's making a million dollars as a re in their retirement. It's pretty good. Here's one that's making forty-six thousand dollars, and the rest of them are like two thousand, five thousand. Okay, very little. So if you sort this data, and you can sort decreasing, so that gives puts the largest values in the front and goes down. Um, boy, once you sort it, you really see how what the distribution is. Here is the uh, the summary of these values. A minimum of zero, a median of seven, but look at the mean, 100. That's because the mean is being strongly influenced by those two extreme values. In fact, mostly the one, mostly the maximum value. The mean is more than twice as big as the second largest value in the data set. So to say that the mean is representing the center of this data set would uh, uh, be dishonest in my opinion. All right, so I'm going to scroll down to where we see the box plots. Here on the far left is the box plot of this data along the vertical axis. We go from zero up to a million, or you know, a thousand thousands, and we see the extreme observation. This point up here, we see the second point there, and then the box has the other ten observations. Now, what happens if we exclude? this most extreme observation. So income is a sorted data set. I'm re going to remove the first element. And the second plot has uh, removed that, that largest one. So we see most of the data is clustered way down here around you know less than 12. And then there's this 40. And if we remove the two largest observations, and in a previous command, I created this data set income two, which removes those two largest values. Here's the distribution of the regular folk. Okay, sort of uh, roughly symmetric between 0 and 12. So when you have extreme observations, it can really influence your plotting as well as um, your numerical summaries. All right, this for me is a very important section. It's a way. Uh, it describes how you're going to communicate what the distribution is for a sample or a population. And so how you interpret the shape of, of plots is really important. So the general practice of statistic is to observe a sample that was collected from a larger set of individuals or you know the population in order to learn something or infer something about the population. And we can make that inference provided that the sample is drawn in such a way that the sample has the similar characteristics as the population. Another way to say that is that the sample rep is representative of the population. And one way to um, philosophically get a representative sample is to draw observations from the population at random. Okay, and there are technical definitions of a random sample um, that you should know from earlier statistics. Effectively, if you enumerate all the uh, possible uh, exper you know, units in the population, and then randomly select a subset such that any possible subset has the same probability of being selected, that is a random sample. All right, so the types of uh, description I want you to be able to use is um, how many modes does the distribution have? Is the distribution symmetric or skewed? Are there any extreme observations? And I'm going to show you examples of uh, different uh, distributions. Okay. So the first distribution I'm going to show you is a normal distribution. 
It is unimodal. It has one peak. It is symmetric. Uh, it happens to be bell-shaped. That's a description of the normal distribution. And it has no outliers. And I'm going to scroll down and show a picture of this. Here's our example. And I, for each distribution, I'm going to show you the histogram of it, a smooth density curve over that histogram. The, uh, at the bottom will be the box plot. And the middle plot has the box plot with that smooth density histogram, which is called a violin plot when it's made symmetric. So this is a normal distribution, or rather 250 points drawn from a normal distribution and plotted in, in several ways. So if you saw this plot, I would want you to to sort of uh, be able to indicate that, yeah, this is uh, roughly symmetric, uh, unimodal, no real extreme observations here. There's one observation here in the right tail, but it's not that far from, from the rest of the points that are reaching out to, to touch it. Uh, this outlier is sponsored by AT&T. So let's uh, see how this data were generated and how it was plotted. I'm drawing points from a normal distribution, and so the norm here is for normal distribution. R indicates I'm going to draw random samples. 250 is the number of observations I'm going to draw, and I'm going to specify a normal distribution with parameters mean equals 100 and standard deviation equals 15. Uh, these are specific numbers. They represent a specific distribution for IQ, Intelligent Quotient Scores. And I'm not going to walk through the plotting commands. We've seen those already. Um, there is one additional one here. On top of the histogram, I have overlaid a density curve, specified alpha equals 0.01, so that you can see through it and filled that density curve with white. Um, I can also specify the color, which is the color of the line. So the color of the line here is black for this curve, and but underneath it's white, so it gives us it gives a slight gray uh, look. Ah, there is one more note. Notice that in the histogram, I have not specified a bin width, and so it does give a warning down here, stat bin, bin width defaulted to range divided by 30. You can use bin width equals some number to adjust to adjust that. Okay, so there's there's roughly thirty bins right there. The numerical summary of this distribution of two hundred fifty points. Uh, I'm going to load the library moments, which is going to give me access to these two new parameters, um, skewness and kurtosis. So here's the five number summary of this distribution. Notice that both the mean and median are close to 100. That's the uh, center of the distribution. The standard deviation is close to 15. So of the 250, um, standard deviation of 15 is closely estimating the true value. The skewness tells us something about whether the data are more shifted to the right or to the left. And so a positive number here, which we're going to see shortly below, uh, rather I should say maybe just here, this number is close to zero, so it's roughly symmetric. And kurtosis indicates the peakiness of the distribution relative to a normal distribution. And so a number is close to zero here, which this is, is um, a peakiness of the distribution that's close to a normal distribution. I've got a stem and leaf plot here, which I'm going to ignore. Let's look at a different distribution. This distribution is going to be unimodal, symmetric, but heavy-tailed. So, and by heavy-tailed, I mean there are some really extreme observations. Okay, It's really peaky in the center, but the difference from left to right is about the same. There is one point out here distorting the look of symmetry of that, but if you ignore that one point, the range here is, is roughly the same. Okay, so that's unimodal, one peak, symmetric, and at least one outlier, probably just one outlier.
the numerical summary now, notice, okay, skewness 1, but kurtosis of 10. So kurtosis, this is a uh, leptokurtotic distribution. That's a kurtotic that is more peaky than a normal distribution. A normal distribution is a little bit smoother than this. So that's leptokurtotic. So here is a distribution that's symmetric, uniform, and short-tailed. In fact, uh, this is a, a uniform distribution over the values from 50 to 150. So in that range, every number in between has equal probability of being selected. And here's that plot. So we've got uh, bars that vary in their heights, but on average are basically pretty flat. And you can see the smooth density histogram is pretty flat. Why do you think it dips down on the left tail, left edge, and the right edge? Uh, it's because beyond the edge of the data, beyond 50 and beyond 150, there's no more points. And so uh, maybe I'll skip over the, the way kernel density estimation is done. But effectively, there aren't more points to prop up that, that edge. So that these dip down at the edge is not an indication that, that this distribution is not uniform. It's just an artifact of how that curve is produced. Look at the box plot. 25% in each of these segments, right? 25% in this whisker, in that left half of the box, the right half of the box, and the right whisker. Each of those is roughly equal, equal spaced. So that's a real indication of uniform distribution. Let's compare that uniform distribution to the normal distribution above. I'll page way up. Look, this is a normal distribution. The box is somewhat narrow, and the whiskers are about one and a half times the width of the box. That's pretty standard for a normal distribution. These outliers, okay, there's one here and one here. I would not officially call these an outlier and I'm going to page up and tell you why right now. These box plots are calibrated in such a way that we expect seven out of a thousand observations to be considered outlier outliers when the distribution is normal. So that is that is how these box plots are calibrated. And so we drew so seven out of a thousand, right? We drew a sample of 250. So 7 out of 1,000, we should expect one or two observations to be extreme. What did we observe in our box plot? One on either side. So that's actually expected. All right, let me page back down. Uh, just have a quick look at the leptokurtotic distribution. Look at how many outliers there are here. Okay, this is clearly indication that this data, data is not normal. It's very narrow in the center, but then there's lots of points in the extreme. So that's called fat tails, because the tails of the distributions have many points. Whereas in the uniform case, this is short tails, because there are no out extreme observations, and the tails, I don't know, these whiskers, for example, are just as long as the center box quarters. All right, skewness. So this is going to be a right skewed distribution. It is right skewed because the extreme observations are to the right. Most of the data is on the left, but the data are skewed toward those extreme observations to the right. So it's called right skew. In the box plot, you can really see that skewness. The left most 25% is really narrow. And then each quarter of the data um, has more and more width until the last quarter of the data, which is spread out almost for the entire plot. Uh, and for the numerical summaries here, the skewness is, oh, I didn't tell you about platykurtotic. My apologies. Back up here on uh, the uniform distribution, 
this is not a peaky distribution at all. It's really flat. And so if we look at the kurtosis number here, kurtosis, it's actually negative. That indicates platykurtotic. Um, my mnemonic for that is it's flat like a platypus's bill. A platykurtotic. Leptokurtotic, I just remember the word. All right. Skewed, so here's our right skewed data again. And skewness here is positive quite a bit. And you'll tend to have kurtosis that's, that's a bit high with skewed distributions. But the main feature here is the skewness. We also have, uh, here's a left skewed distribution. All of these have been unimodal so far. So here's a, the distribution that's left skewed, skewed toward the left tail. It's unimodal because it has only one obvious clear peak. And are there outliers? I would say certainly down on that extreme left tail. And if we look at the skewness here, we have a negative number indicating that direction. I don't really re want you relying on the skewness and kurtosis numbers. I really want you to be looking at the shape of the, the plot. All right, so you can have multimodal uh, data. It happens especially when populations, there's two different groups in a population. So here's a distribution that has a peak somewhere around 100, and then a second peak somewhere around 150. What is the interesting quality of this? The center? The center here is maybe around 125. But for me, that's not really an interesting number. For me, it's it, it looks like there's maybe a mixture of two populations that are laying on top of each other. And I really want to understand, OK, there, it looks like there's a peak around 100. That's sort of one characteristic of this population. Another characteristic of this population is the peak around 150. You know, this might be, I mean, these numbers don't make sense here, but it could be the heights of men and women, right? Men have their own center and spread for height. Women have their center and spread for height, which is slightly less than men. And so it's possible to get a bimodal distribution like that. So what's what's the center and what's the spread of this distribution? I would say that those numbers are not uh, interesting. And maybe one thing to point out is look at the box plot. This box plot makes it look like we have a uniform distribution. And it's not until you plot the data in higher resolution that you see the real interesting features. So my recommendation always is to plot all of the data and show as much as possible. I think a, I think a nice summary of this histogram is actually this violin plot in this case, if you want to use a, a very simple forms to describe the patterns. All right, so let's look at a couple questions around graphical summaries. In this data, which would be larger, the mean or the median, or maybe you can't tell? Because this data is skewed to the right, the median is going to separate uh, the lower 50% from the upper 50%. So the median here is probably somewhere over to the left whereas the, the mean is going to be pulled out toward the right toward those more extreme observations. So the mean here should be the larger value. And if you go back in the lecture notes and look at those skewed distributions and compare the mean and median, you'll see those qualities. And that's the end of those questions. All right. There's a little bit of text here to interpret some of the examples that you saw, a little bit of discussion with R. And my main comment here about R is that when you're first learning to program in R, pretty good is often good enough. It's very easy to get sucked in to spending lots of time improving a plot, playing with colors, and oh, so much garbage. Don't get sucked into all that stuff. The defaults that I just used are I use the defaults on almost everything, look pretty good, okay? 
So if it's the difference between spending 20 minutes producing a nice plot versus spending two hours or more on one single plot, don't waste your time. Take the defaults, you know, make, maybe make one or two adjustments and move on with your life. There's so many good things to do in life yeah. <laughs> that doesn't involve mucking around with R. All right, so that is numerical and graphical summaries for univariate numerical data.